Okay, so let's try this again. And for your next one, I would suggest um, try being a tad more menacing uh, or a little bit more aggressive. Got it. And whenever you're ready, take it away. Son, I'm a U.S. Deputy Marshal and I'm looking for George Bitter Creek Newcomb, part of the Doolin Dalton gang whom I hear is hiding out around here somewhere. Now, I doubt you can read, but there's a $5,000 reward on his head. And what I'd like to know is can that tub of jelly between your ears and straddling your skull fire enough neurons to lift that fat, lazy finger of yours and point accurately for me where I might find him? Over there? Good. Let's go for a walk. You could use the exercise. Wonderful, Gunner. That was great. I enjoyed that approach to the scene. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. We'll be in touch. Sounds good. I was racing motocross in Florida. I found a job uh, with a motorcycle distributor called Motorcycle Stuff. And they distributed like Dunlop tires and, you know, belt helmets and stuff like that. And it was a great, it was a great job for me to race, but make a living kind of in the motorcycle industry in a weird way. When dad got transferred out here, I was able to go to work for AXO. By then I'd been with Honda, oh gosh, probably 11 or 12 years myself. And I had uh, become assistant manager at, here in Torrance at the home office. And so there was a, a tremendous growth happening on the race side of things. And the racing was changing rapidly with TV coverage and social media beginning to take, take place. It was at that pinnacle of AXO with Bradshaw and Honda of Troy, and uh, and I got a chance to to see that world, and then from AXO to Spy, and the guys from No Fear, which was an amazing experience. And uh, I mean, again, those guys were at their pinnacle, you know. And Jeremy had just started uh, getting involved with with Spy Optic, and then Honda saw the need, not me personally, but Honda saw the need that somebody that could reach out and work closer with all of those entities, particularly on road racing and uh, supercross side. They began looking for someone to fill a position. They created this job. And uh, I was aware of it because of where I was at in my position. Honda was getting ready to build in a PR position. They had never done it before. It was gonna be in-house. They wanted someone young. They wanted someone who could follow the supercross, the motocross circuit, but also do road racing and off-road like Baja. At that time, I think Gunner was working for Spy and uh, No Fear Group. When I read the job description, I thought, then that's that's him. That's you know, that's that's what he does. And I encouraged him to apply for that job. 
And then honestly, I, I backed away from it. I didn't want anyone in the company to say, well, he got the job because, you know, I was there kind of thing. I put a resume together, get a formal sit down interview where they had me on camera. They're like, hey, if this guy's gonna be a, a PR person, he's gotta be able to, to possibly answer some serious subjects on camera and also work with media. So my, I call it an audition, but my interview was literally an interview on camera where they were asking me questions and wanted to see how I reacted. And uh, I don't know, I think it was six or seven months later, I, I didn't think I, I got the job. And then um, I get a phone call from Honda HR saying that I got the job and uh, I, I was just so blown away. And it was, it was like another four years of on the job training. It's one thing if any of us get a job and you're replacing somebody because there's a sort of a benchmark to shoot for or, and there's history that you can rely on. But that was a job that didn't exist. It, it didn't exist within Honda. And, and as far as I know, it didn't exist in any company anywhere as a standalone job. So he took a blank sheet of paper and along with his management team, they really carved out a niche that lives even today, you know, almost 20 years later. My first year, imagine this, Anaheim 1, 1999. You've got Ezra Lusk, Kevin Windham, Sebastian Tortelli, Mikhail Pichon, Cliff White's the team manager. And it was like, a, in a way, it was like a rock band. You had these amazing personalities. You had this incredible look. Everyone, of course, is chasing Jeremy McGrath. And here we go. We go. We, we, we not only sweep the podium first, second, and third, but we do first, second, first, second, third, and fourth. And eventually, what I started to realize was you're one of the, the hot tickets in town. So a lot of the celebrities in Hollywood, a lot of the stunt community, you know, they're hanging out in the pits especially for the Anaheim rounds. They're coming by the Honda race truck. Uh, you're being introduced to people. You're taking them into the semi. You're introducing them to the riders. I was introduced in a really great, just not to say organic way, but it was. It was a very natural way to be introduced into Hollywood to where, first off, I saw opportunities with media outside of the motorcycle industry. Like around Binghamton, I had become friends with some of the people at GQ magazine. And we started talking about maybe a photo editorial with Team Honda uh, with fashion clothes mixed with their motocross gear at a track for a fashion spread in GQ. So imagine like Ezra in a $5,000 snakeskin leather jacket with his Fox Honda motocross gear slamming a berm, you know, or Kevin Windham, there's like, there's a photo of him uh, washing his boots off, and yet he's got, you know, some $8,000 uh, fashion piece on. And it was awesome. Like those kinds of things I started to easily work into. And then for me, I think the, the big thing was because of my love for music and, and, and trying to do more things with music, I had befriended someone from Universal Records, uh, this, this A&R girl, and she called me and she said, hey, look, we've got this artist that's trying to break in the United States. Her name is Paulina Rubio. And her latest music video, she's riding this motorcycle in this music video. We're gonna do a huge press launch at Universal Studios in Hollywood. Would you be willing to ride her on a motorcycle for the press? And I just saw it as a huge opportunity, mainly for Honda, but also uh, to do something really cool and outside of the box. And so Alpine Stars had made me a special suit uh, I had a Honda, uh, I think a VFR 800, something that looked like the bike that she was riding in the video. I got her on the back and, you know, on cue, we, I ride up in front of the media and there was something in that changed something in me to where I was like, whatever that was, I want to do that again. At that point, after about four years of Honda, I realized I don't want to be the dirt bike guy. I needed to kind of make some changes and I talked to my boss. I'm like, look, I, I, I don't quite know yet what I want to do, whether it's music industry or, or Hollywood or what, but I feel like I need to make a change. 
and Gary Christopher, my boss, was amazing. He's like, look, he's like, here's the deal. He's like, you're always welcome back. But don't be the 55, 60 year old guy who questioned what if. You need to go and make this happen if this is what you want to do. And so I did. I, I left Honda and, and, and with good graces. I, I'm sort of old school guy. So my thinking is you get your foot in the door with a company like Honda. That's a pretty good gig. You know, you don't you don't leave that kind of thing. But uh, at the same time, uh, he's not me. You know, he, he was always his own person. And immediately I start hosting a motorcycle lifestyle show. I was good with a teleprompter. Uh, I flew to Atlanta to audition for this job. It's more like celebrity lifestyle based and I book it. And I had this false sense of, see, there you go. This is easy. You know, this transition is not going to be a problem at all. Until that show had some financial issues that went away. I was owed money. And uh, now I'm sitting there going, what am I going to do? I've got no job. And then there was this long period of, you know, bleak. I mean, I went bankrupt. My dad was like, what are you doing? You know, like, what, what, what are you, what is your goal? And I didn't really have an answer. So, you know, there was some friction there, which I totally understand. I got my guitar. I was living in Venice Beach. I went to the Strand. I played five hours a day for about four weeks until that production check came because I was pretty much on fumes. You talk about whether you're a supercross racer or a movie star or a basketball player and you start making really good money, how do you manage it? I went from this very consistent, you know, being good with money, but the paycheck's coming to being in an industry where you might not get paid for four or five months. You might get paid a lot but that might be your paycheck for the next nine months. And you've got to manage that. And there was so much immaturity in me in a lot of ways from that perspective that I did. I, I, I had financial problems. I went bankrupt. And at, at one point I was in New York. I had a song that some a and executives actually liked and they wanted to hear some more music. So I fly back to LA and I'm banging out these songs, which they hated, they didn't like it. it. was like, I never got a call again. I had to dig myself out of those situations. I had to really learn the value of being responsible when you get that big paycheck. And, uh, and it was a blessing because all those things, they build character. Everything from playing the guitar out on the strand to having to go through bankruptcy and, and deal with maturing, especially on the business side. I get a play in LA and a few commercial gigs and some things that lined up and i learned real quick okay this is something that you know you can't serve two masters and the idea of moonlighting in hollywood that is not going to work for me i don't have the looks and you know talent was subpar at best and so i was all in i i got a manager i got an agent i finished the play and then quickly for me it was commercials because of my motorcycle background I took some precision car driving courses, obviously acting classes, and it was a slow process. It was, it was a lot of, of, uh, of, of lean years. You know, you've got to go through those. A, to make sure it's something that you really want to do, and B, there were so many things that I had to learn, in some ways the hard way, to where, you know, you get to that point where you do walk into a room and you feel like you belong. It's not about being cocky, it's just you feel comfortable. Dead Space is a science fiction horror video game franchise from EA in which the original game, the lead character, Isaac Clarke, didn't speak. So when EA was developing Dead Space 2, they wanted to give Isaac a voice. I was brought in to audition for the role. I ended up doing the voiceover and the motion capture acting for Isaac, which is amazing. And that's been over 10 years now. And that started to, to change things. I booked this job, uh, it's, it's great pay, and I literally ride this Harley from Malibu to Mendocino for seven days and have an amazing shoot with Will Eubank. After that wraps, Will calls me and says, hey, I got approached by Tom DeLong 
uh, from Blink-182, who's got this other band project called Angels and Airwaves. And he said that Tom's got this high concept visual love letter that, that they want to shoot for their upcoming album that's centered around an astronaut. And he asked me who he thought would be, you know, a great actor for that. And he goes, I just worked with this guy uh, on this motorcycle pilot who's got that all American, you know, he's on a model. He, he looks like he could be clean shaven, an astronaut. And so I met with Tom through Will and uh, he, uh, Tom talked about the concept and I said, I'm in, you know, I'm, whatever this is going to be, let's do it. ISS module 32 Delta, this is Cambridge. How are you feeling now that you've been able to settle in? Good. Um, the station's in pretty decent shape. <laughs> what Will did was take pre-existing rentable Hollywood sets that they were charging an arm and a leg and went, we can't afford that. We don't quite know what we want to do yet. My parents have a ranch up in San Ynez. I think I've got an idea in a way. My brothers and I, with a few credit cards and a Home Depot, can re replicate what we want to do and have it on the property so we can have four or five weeks of principal photography and not feel rushed. We're not renting any of that. And they literally took and built, imagine like take a, like two half pipes, stack them on top of each other on wheels, like a Lego set that you could split apart. And then with his background at Panavision, you know, on Saturdays and Sundays, box vans of gear would show up lenses and cameras that had to be back by Monday morning, cleaned and ready to go because probably some big studio needed them. But it was genius because that's movie magic. You didn't need all of it at one time. And the way that he could cheat the shots, you could split the space station apart and get different angles and, and replicate or uh, you know create different dynamics with you know, probably an area not much larger than this room. Once I saw what he was building, I was on board. I'm like, let's go. And then living on the ranch, he'd have an idea. And we had kind of, I wouldn't call it a script, but it was a loose outline. But there was so many of these moments where it's like 3 a.m. And he's waking me up going, hey, I got this idea. And cameras were pretty much already set. And because of his cinematography background, he could run the camera. Lights were already set up. Crews are asleep, but he just has this vision of something that he wants and he only needs me. You know, and, and uh, there's some, wardrobe was pretty simple and I got matted hairdo. And he's like, that's perfect. That works great for this scene. And we would literally walk down to the set. We'd walk down to set, he'd turn the camera and the lights on and whatever that was, that was in his head, we'd spend 30 minutes getting it. And there's so many of those moments in the film that I laugh because they weren't planned. They were these last moment visuals that he could see. He didn't need the crew. And it was probably better that we didn't have a structured schedule that way because it was immediate. You're not gonna get that with a studio film. You're not gonna get that on a Netflix, even Mandalorian on Disney Plus. It's like there's still a structure we had this playground and this freedom to just hit that camera's red button and uh, see what we see. I didn't know what to expect. And what you have to understand is there are so many big budgeted projects that never get finished. Or they do get finished, but they get shelved. And you hear that at a high level to where here's an indie film and even the director at the time, and even Tom's going, you know, I hope we can see this thing through and just get it finished to where now all of a sudden I'm hearing that, you know, there's some buzz with the film. There's some offers being thrown around. Being in Tom's shoes, I totally get it. It's like, here's something that 
you've spent time and passion and love for, and you don't need to just give it away. Tom was like, look, I don't need your money. I'm gonna go on tour next year. We got a new album coming. It's like, what's best for the film? And is it best to just give it to you and not quite have control over what you're gonna do with it? And, um, and yeah, for him, he saw fit to release it on his own terms. I got a chance to see countries that I would have never gone to and really get a chance to be a part of something that was straight up rock stardom for an indie film that would have gone to an indie film festival, would have done some press, signed a few autographs. Nothing like what I saw with Love. There's radio stations hyping it up. There's the local news stations there. Uh, there's lines around the block. They're having to block off traffic because it's a fiasco. And, you know, Tom's coming out and he's just getting mobbed like you see in those videos of the old classic rock stars, especially in countries that, you know, are, that really appreciate what that means to be a rock star, to be a movie star. And that enthusiasm is the mobbing is out really out of love. Um, and, and I watched, I learned from guys like Tom, he would stand there and sign every autograph that came, every photo to where I'm the star of the movie going, okay, well, he's kind of the boss. And, and you, and you, and I learned, I, I learned what that responsibility was, you know, and, and Will too. I mean, Will was amazing. Um, just the interviews that we had to do and the autographs that you would sign and that, and, and that frenzy that I've done some indie films since some really good ones, but I've never felt like I've never seen what I saw with love. And that's really the testament of someone like a Tom DeLong being a part of the project. It sounds so crazy, but here I am all these years later, you know, uh, I'm someone who, part of my job is to get into wardrobe. But when I was a little kid, the helmet represented so much to me. It's something that you put on, it's something that can kind of transform you, let alone the boots and the, you know, the gloves and the goggles. But the helmet was one of the first things that just signified a character. 
whether it was Boba Fett, you know, or the motocross helmet for its design and what it invoked. And then you get on the bike and like talking to my dad about it for him, it's just bona fide freedom. You, you, you really do get a chance to just, whatever's on your mind goes away, especially at speed or intensity, because that's the only thing you can focus on is that rut, that jump, that obstacle or that competitor. Motorcycling in general, man, even if I'm having a tough day and I just get on the motorcycle and head up the hill, all of that falls away. I got a little Vespa and even just going to the grocery store and pinning that little guy down Hollywood Boulevard to go get milk, you get a little taste. I throw the helmet on, I get a little, a little feel of that role play and you just twist the throttle. There's something about that that is universal. I've ridden a motorcycle in Holland. I shot a movie in Nepal where one of the, one of the uh, militia guys had a, a little Yamaha 250, like this crazy, almost like a street bike, but they pin him sideways on you know gravel and dirt roads. And he found out that I had raced and like, please ride my bike. And it's something that's amazing. I've been around the world and motorcycles are one of those things like a guitar, they're universal. And if you're a motorcyclist, whether you ride a 450 motocross bike or a Vespa, there's something that connects you without any words needing to be said. And that's something that there's so many things that I owe to my parents, especially my dad. But just the fact that all these years later, I don't get a chance to ride motocross as much as I'd like to, but just having a motorcycle in the garage that I can just get on, throw my helmet on, which, which by the way, with helmets for me, they're like purses. You know, I've got a lot of helmets for different occasions, you know, um, but there's something special that just still to this day, cranking that throttle, it's, it's a feeling that I, that I, I never want to give up.